10 Facts About Wu Zetian, the only female emperor of China. Almost every great nation has had at least one distinguished woman leader. History has not been kind to China's only female empress, Wu Zetian. What is the truth about this extraordinary woman who rose to greatness in a man's world? Was she really such an evil monster? Here are the top 10 facts. Wu Zetian was born in 624 in Wenshui, now Shanxi province in China. She was a real beauty, and that was her ticket into Emperor Taizong's palace when she was just 13 as a concubine. Emperors surrounded themselves with stunning-looking women and young girls. Being a concubine was the equivalent of making it as a beauty pageant queen. But looks only get you so far. She was also extremely well-read, determined, intelligent, and knew when to make the most of any given opportunity. She became friendly not just with Tai Zhang, but with his heir, Gao Zhang, too. This could have cost her her head, but instead saved her life. Tai Zhang died in 649, and that meant all his women had to live out the rest of their lives in a Buddhist convent. But Gao Zhang couldn't do without Wu, and had her brought from the convent to be his favorite companion. But that wasn't enough for Wu. She had her eye on the main prize, and after eliminating a few obstacles, became empress herself in 655. She gave Gao Zhang four sons and one daughter. Now, about those obstacles. When Wu was brought back to court, Gao Zhang's wife, Lady Wang, and his chief concubine, Xiao Shu Fai, were not impressed. Lady Wang didn't have any children and so was very insecure about her position at court. Xiao Shu Fai had a boy and two girls. It wasn't long before Wu had two sons of her own and the emperor doted on them. Soon she had a daughter, but she tragically died after a week. Exactly how she died, we don't know. Some people say Wu smothered her own child herself and then blamed Lady Wang for the death as she had been the last to hold her. The empress was found guilty and banished to a distant part of the palace. Wu also implicated Xiao in the death, and she too was exiled. The emperor divorced Lady Wang and married Wu. He was a weak leader, and Wu became the power behind the throne. It is said that the first thing she did as empress was order the hands and feet of Lady Wang and Xiao to be cut off, and then were thrown into a vat of wine to drown, saying, Now these witches can get drunk to their bones. But these accusations may have been made up after Wu's death as a means of destroying her reputation. There aren't any records of these crimes from her lifetime. In fact, they bear a remarkable resemblance to the crimes of infamous Empress Lu Ji, who in 194 BC was said to be all that is evil. She would make people drink acid and amputate limbs. The people who blamed Wu for deliberately killing her child may simply have resented her rise to power. Or perhaps there was some truth in it. One thing we do know is that she dealt with her enemies quickly and decisively. There were plenty of people at court who opposed her marriage to the emperor. They were exiled or terminated. Being related to Wu didn't mean you were safe. If anything, you were more of a threat. This was a real-life Game of Thrones. Her teenage niece had caught the attention of Gao Zhang. Not long after, she was found dead from being poisoned. When the emperor had a stroke, Wu ruled China for the next 23 years. Now the only people standing in her way of being emperor were her sons. The crown prince Li Hong stood up to his mother. He was then mysteriously poisoned. Another son was charged with treason and his mum sent him into exile. Her third son came to the throne as Emperor Zhang Zhang, but only lasted a couple of months before his mother banished him in favor of her youngest son, Rui Zhang. His wife, Empress Liu, was an intelligent, capable woman, and this may be why she was called a witch and was no longer seen at court, or anywhere else. Rui Zhang was kept under house arrest and Wu made all decisions for him before making him abdicate. She was finally emperor in her own right. No flowers on Mother's Day, though. She showed her enemies no mercy and also disposed of several members of her own family. But there is always a double standard when comparing male and female rulers. 
Emperor Taizong forced his own father to abdicate and physically fought his own brothers to claim the throne. Wu showed a ruthlessness which wouldn't have caused much of a fuss if she had been a man. History has been unkind to Wu. In the last few years, we found out about some of her incredible achievements for which she deserves more credit. Wu revolutionized the job market. Instead of the best government jobs going to wealthy, noble families, she introduced the system of keiju, where applicants had to sit entrance exams. This meant it didn't matter what your background was. If you were intelligent, you could rise up in society, a system still in place today. Perhaps it was her own humble beginnings and seeing how useless the nobility were that prompted her to want the best brain solving her country's problems. Maybe she knew that she couldn't count on the stuck-up male aristocracy to support her. If she championed new, intelligent talent, they would back her and be loyal. She wanted to give bright children a helping hand and had schools built to fast-track those showing promise for a career in the imperial government. Wu had gently and subtly moved power away from the aristocracy to bureaucrats without spilling a drop of blood. Genius. Wu set up her own secret police force around 660 in her court and throughout the country. She also had a series of copper boxes placed in her capital if you wanted to snitch on your neighbor. Informants could get free travel on public transport to report to the court. The spy system gave her early warnings of any potential plots against her. She also used the intelligence gathering to put pressure on high-ranking officials to resign, if they were lucky. The unlucky ones were banished or terminated. She replaced them with intellectuals and talented people. The religion of the state was Confucianism, and that's what most of the men in Wu's court signed up to. It did not believe that women were fit to rule. It's hardly surprising to hear that this was not for her. Instead, she was a Buddhist, as were most of the ordinary people in her country. She built pagodas all over China for the Buddhist population. Perhaps the grandest of them all was the giant wild goose pagoda. It held prayers and images of the Buddha. She also had statues built. One of the most awe-inspiring is the grottos at Longmen near her capital. For centuries, the elite have paid to have a cave with a carving of the Buddha in it ranging in size. The smallest is one inch and the largest, made for Wu, is 57 feet. It is called the Radiant Buddha and is said to be modeled on her face. China was rich under Wu's leadership. The aristocracy grumbled about her all day long, but the people loved and respected her. She made sure that they had enough to eat and farmers could do the best with their land. She kept the farm taxes low and used irrigation to increase the amount of land that could be farmed. She also had farming manuals given out. She kept a close eye on who owned how much to make sure the peasants could still be free and farm independently. The number of agricultural households doubled during her reign. When crops were good, she ordered rice to be stockpiled in giant grain stores across China. Half the empire's rice was stockpiled here so it could be redistributed in hard times. These came in the early 7th century when the country suffered a terrible drought. It could have been much worse had it not been for the rice stores. Archaeologists have found figurines from her reign which show women having more freedoms than ever before. There is a woman on a red horse, another woman wearing men's clothes. During her reign, women didn't need to worry about how they dressed. They were free to explore the arts such as riding a horse, writing poetry, practicing archery, playing music, and chess. Women could divorce and remarry. She also changed the law so that children could mourn the death of their mothers as well as their fathers. Wu loved tearing down barriers, and so she hired China's first woman prime minister. Sheng Guan Wan heir didn't have to marry a well-connected man to become powerful. She became China's first woman prime minister based on her brilliant abilities and nothing else. It did help that the emperor was a woman too. Sheng Guan's father and grandfather had been dispatched by Emperor Gao Zhang for planning to topple Empress Wu. This meant Sheng Guan and her mother were forced to be servants. She had a brilliant education at court, and her intelligence meant she was spotted by Wu, who kept her as a personal secretary. 
Eventually, she made all important military and civil decisions on her own. She was a great, well-respected poet. She stayed on as prime minister for Wu's successor, Emperor Zhang Zhang. Eventually, she was terminated when she found herself on the wrong side of a political argument. Her grave was found in 2013 and has been badly damaged on purpose. Malicious hands had wanted to take back power that had for a few years been given to a woman who had helped China become a superpower. Ancient historians have written about this being a time of one terrible crisis after another, but there's no evidence of this. In fact, quite the opposite. Wu Zetian united China to be an economically and politically stable empire. Her China was at the center of a trade industry that stretched from Japan to the Mediterranean. In the 7th century, her capital city had a million people living within the city walls and another million living outside them, which was bigger than anywhere else on earth at the time. Markets would sell jewels, metals, and spices from India, Sri Lanka, Iran, and many other countries. Since 4000 BC, China's silk had been the must-have commodity. It was as valuable as gold. Rich merchants would risk their lives traveling the silk roads, which were crime hotspots. Bandits wandered wild and free with no one policing the routes. Wu decided to build military outposts all along the silk roads to secure safe passage. This brought people from all over the world to China and her capital city became one of the most cosmopolitan in the world. She lost her grip on power when she was 80, and when asked to abdicate, she did so without a fuss. History has not been kind to her memory, but that is slowly starting to change. She showed that in a man's world, a woman could bring about great change. Was she evil or good? Has she had a bad rep or did she deserve it? Let us know in your comments below. Don't forget to like our videos and click on the subscribe button so you don't miss out on our latest content.